Okay, so we'll start the chupa. Okay, um, last week we spoke about the uh, first segment of the chupa ceremony, which is the kiddushin, the betrothal, the ring ceremony. And we spoke about the ring ceremony gave us two clues to what it takes to have a good marriage. One is to have good words, to constantly be telling each other, Hareat mikudeshitli, you are betrothed to me, I love you, I care for you. And the second part, uh, which was the ring ceremony, that's the, the emphasis on gifts. And we spoke a little bit about uh, you know, the importance of, of gifts. So uh, today we're gonna go to the second segment of the chuppah, which is uh, the, uh, the reading of the ketubah. We all know the ketubah is the marriage document. I'm gonna speak a little bit to that and then we'll speak about some other aspects of the chuppah. The first we'll start with the reading of the ketubah. We all know that the ketubah is the marriage document. Today we need to get everything in writing. So it's not enough that we just uh, create the marriage. Um, publicly, we create, it, we create the marriage uh, through giving a gift and saying, you are betrothed to me, but you also need to have uh, the second aspect of the, of the wedding ceremony, which is a contract. It's contractually based. You all know that this contract of the, of the ketubah is to secure the woman's position in the marriage. And there is a form of alimony, if God forbid, the, uh, the wedding falls apart, the marriage falls apart. The wife is secure, especially the olden days where they didn't have a lot of money. So they had to make sure that, that the, the woman was, uh, was safe and she was uh, secure financially, if God forbid the husband predeceases ceases or if it's separated. But the main thrust of the ketubah right at the very beginning is the husband declares to his wife in the ketubah, Ana eflach, I'm gonna work hard for you. Be'eker, I will honor you. Be'ezein, and I will support you. And I will give you parnosa. You know, parnosa by Yidin, they call parnosa. As it says, as has been customary for faithful Jewish husbands for the millennia. So what is the Ketubah saying? The Ketubah speaks about how the husband commits himself to take care of his wife. For a lot of people, that's a very important part of marriage. We like to be pampered by our spouse, whether it's the husband to the wife or the wife to the husband, you know. Although the, 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 the ketubah primarily speaks about the husband's responsibilities, but the wife has just as many responsibilities. Husbands and wives need to pamper each other, take care of each other, be there for each other. And we call it acts of service. So this is another key to the Jewish heart. Okay, that is to, to take care of each other, to do acts of service for each other. And that's very important. For many people, the marriage is based on that, of us taking, doing acts of service, almost like in the, in the relationship with God. God tells us, you know, he has a few things for us to do for him, a few things that he likes a few acts of service that he likes us to do. What are they? Yeah, I just, God says, I just have 613 things that I want you to do for me. <laughs> right? We're also married, God said to the Jewish people. And now I want you to do the 10 commandments, 613 mitzvot. What are they? You have to view it as acts of service. As we know that all of Judaism is called the service of God. Right? We stand in service of, 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 of Hashem. Because it's not, because, not as a, like some people view it as a, as a onus, as a onerous thing, as God is telling us, I want you to do this, what is that? Commandments. No, it's not that. The real word for mitzvah, mitzvah means connection. So it's about a relationship. God is telling us, if, if you want to know what makes me happy, I'll, I'll tell you. These 613 things are things I like 
that people do for me. Those are my acts of service. You know, there's a story of a rabbi that was standing on Yom Kippur in the, the lobby. And there was, a, there was a big dedication of the wall for all the, uh, the martyrs, all the soldiers that fought in World War I or World War II. Many shuls have it, you know, in America, Canada, you know, have synagogue, they have all the people that died in, 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 in the wars. And the rabbi was meditating over the wall. He's reading all the names. It was Yom Kippur. He had a few minutes. He looked, he's looking at the name. And a young little boy comes also to shul and he walks past the rabbi. And um, he asks the rabbi, Rabbi, what are you looking at? He says, oh, my son. These are all the men that died in service. The young boy looks bewildered. He asks the rabbi, uh, they died in service? Which service? Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur? And uh, the rabbi says, <laughs> my son, Talk about the service of the army, not the, the service services in the shul of Rosh Hashanah. The kid thought the number of people were dying in the services. Anyways, so service is not for us to die in. It's not for us to, do, to, to perish in. It's for us to, uh, to stand in service of a spouse is a great honor and privilege. And uh, some people will die in the service, but you know, that's, not, that's not the goal. That's not what it's about. So when we get married, we make a promise to each other under the chuppah. They recommit ourselves to the acts of service for each other. For some people, it's more important than gifts. It's more important than, than nice words, compliments. They like to see, like, you know, when sometimes a wife sees a husband washing the dishes. It makes her very happy. It makes her feel like marriage is fulfilling. It fills up what we say her love tank when she sees her husband doing the dishes. Hey, it's a great thing. You know, someone once came to the Lubavitcher Rebbe and they asked him, they said, Rabbi, you're a very wise rabbi. Maybe you could answer the question. I heard many years ago that at the end of Shabbat, a Motzi Shabbat, that's when Shabbos is over, it's a big mitzvah for the husband to fold his talit. Now, Shabbos, it says in the shul, you're not supposed to fold your talis. Don't fold your talis in shul. Because on Shabbos, you're not supposed to measure the talis, so you leave it like on your place. And after Shabbos comes, you take the talis and you're supposed to fold it. And it's, he asked the rabbi, he says he heard that. Folding the talus on Saturday night, because usually the wife gives the husband as a gift the talus. So if you fold up the talus on Saturday night, it's it's a good omen. It's good luck for shalom bayit, for peace at home between the husband and the wife. Because when the husband spends time with, with great love, he takes the talus and he folds it and he remembers it's a talus his wife gave him as a gift by the wedding. So that brings Shalom by. See, so ask the Rebbe, he says, Rebbe, is, is this true? Is there such an idea out there? Does that make sense that if you fold your talus, it brings peace in the house? So the Rebbe says, I, I don't know. So I never heard of this. I don't know about this thing with the talus, whether it brings peace in the home. But the Rebbe says, I can tell you one thing. That if you wash the dishes on Saturday night from Shabbat, that for sure will bring you peace in the home. <laughs> Right, because they never understood that sometimes for marriage, just like we're in service of God with the mitzvot, when we do things for each other, that is for many people very, very important. And we see great rabbis that they used to do like a lot of things, a lot of tasks for the family, uh, you know, at home, even though it might have been beneath their dignity, so to speak, you know. They'd get down, they go vacuum the floor, or they go, uh, you know, sweep the floor. They, they would, you know, change the light bulbs or do whatever it is. In the olden days, the Gemara says, for Shabbos, for Shabbos, there would be many of the rabbis would go out there and they would uh, um, buy stuff. And they would buy the fish, 
and go buy the fish and bring it home. Another rabbi used to fry the fish, he used to, uh, you know, uh, cook the fish. So in the Gemara, it says it's for Shabbos. But we know that the, why the rabbis were very wise. They knew that when you do acts of service in the home, that brings shalom bias, and that makes a good Shabbos. If you want to have a good Shabbos in the house, you do things for the family, right? So the greatest, some of the greatest rabbis, the Talmud says, they used to go, you know, ever since I'm married, I always, I always like try to do a few things for Shabbos, obviously, many things. But I always like, one thing I do is I always go to Sobeys. I've been going to Sobeys since before it was called Sobeys. I go every Friday, it's my thing, whatever, whatever it's worth. I do it because, you know, so people say, Rabbi, what are you doing here shopping? You know, I do it for Shabbos. But I also do it as acts of service. <laughs> I always go doing the shopping and every, every Friday. I've been doing it for, for 36 years. And that's my thing. I do a few other things in the house too. Um, you know, I'm not gonna give any grade on my, my husbandhood, but that's something that I do. Um, but you know, some people think it's beneath their dignity, you know, like, oh, what am I, oh I'm gonna do like little, you know, someone could catch me in the store and say, you know, what are, what are you, you know, you're a rabbi, you should be shopping. Oh, but that's for Shabbos and it's for my wife. You, know, you, do, you do things you have to do for home. But, you know, there was, there was once a story. Uh, you know, there's a young married couple. A young fellow comes to the rabbi and he's studying the first year. Many communities, the, the, the Hassan studies the first year in yeshiva, whatever, the kollel it's called, right? And then afterwards they get a job. The first year, just to settle down, they, they go and study in the yeshiva. So in some communities, they actually do it for 10, 20 years. That, that's in certain communities. Um, most, in most communities, they go, they, they sit for about a year or two till the family settles down and then they start their job, whatever it is, right? So uh, this one uh, fellow comes to the rabbi, he just got married, he comes to the, to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, he says, I, I don't know what to say, you know, I'm a rabbinical student. I'm a rabbi with one of the biggest, best heads here in the, in the, in the school here. And I'm a future great rabbi, he says. He says to the old rabbi, his name is Shlema Zalman Orbach, who was a famous rabbi in Jerusalem. He comes to the rabbi and says, Rabbi Shlema Zalman, you're my master, you're my teacher. What do I do? My wife wants me to take out the garbage. It's beneath my dignity. Garbage, me? Such a holy guy, such a great fellow. I'm going to take out the garbage? Rabbi says, uh, let me think about it. Let me think about it. Um, the next morning, student is in the house, and uh, there's a knock on the door. The rabbi, it's a rabbi, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman. He's the rabbi, big rabbi from Jerusalem, one of the greatest rabbis. He's, he's at the door, tells his wife, the rabbi is here. The rabbi walks in. He says, Rabbi, what, what are you doing here? You came to my house. He says, you remember you asked me a question about that taking out the garbage is beneath your dignity. He says, I think I need to show you how to take out the garbage. I'm going to take out the garbage for you because I think it's so important for your marriage to do that. Let me show you how to take out the garbage. Could you imagine this big rabbi? He was going to show his student what shalom bias is, what it means, that peace in the home, that never to think that an act of service, that makes your wife happy. The rabbi himself came to show him, look, this is how you take out the garbage. A very wise rabbi. He understood that all the Torah and all the studying that this student has, he was full of himself. Especially when it came to, to making his marriage stronger, he should have been there first thing. So this is the, this is the story of the of the, uh, of the, of the, I'll tell you another story. I always tell you a few stories in a row. There's another rabbi who just passed away this year. His name is Yael Khan. Yael Khan was a Chabad rabbi. He was, he was a professor of, of, of Hasidic teachings in, in New York. He probably, in, in, in all of Chabad, maybe, maybe even all the generations of Chabad, one of the smartest, deepest uh, professors and teachers in the Chabad Academy in New York. People would flock from all over the world to hear his classes. 
He had a beautiful uh, brain, photographic mind. He used to be the one that used to, uh, after the Rebbe used to speak a whole Shabbos, he would remember word for word what the Rebbe would say. And afterwards they would, they would transcribe it after Shabbos from his, primarily from his memory. Do other people also help them out? He used to have on Saturday night, after the Rebbe would speak, there'd be a group of people come together, different students, and they would, they would try to remember. But he was like the main memory because he was like a photographic mind. It's absolutely insane. But in addition to that, in addition to having a, a photographic mind, he also had an, an amazing ability, amazing uh, eloquence, and to and an ability to, to break down concepts, very, very deep concepts, and, and to, to present it in a way that everyone was able to understand. The deepest philosophical ideas of Hasidus. Let me tell you, as deep as Kabbalah is, Hasidus has within it, Chabad Hasidus, especially it's Chochmah Bina Das, some of the deepest ideas, mystical ideas about the creation of the universe and about how we can apply it to day-to-day -to -day or day-to-day -day life. So he was able to take the, the loftiest ideas and, and present it. So he was, he was held in, he was very humble. He was held in great reverence in the community. And everybody knew him as, 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 as one, of the, one of the greats. So one morning, uh, he, he, he lived a few blocks away from the, from the synagogue we used to teach. And one morning, he's, he's walking into shul, into the shul where we also was the yeshiva, the yeshiva, he's walking in. And, you know, he was like a big professor. So he was, his head was like, I don't know where it was. It was in other places, right? He was like a mad professor kind of thing, right? So he's walking in with a big bag of garbage into the shul, into the, into the yeshiva, a big black garbage bag. <laughs> one of the students asked the rabbi, what are you doing with the garbage bag in yeshiva? He says, oi, he says, oi. My wife asked me to take out the garbage <laughs> and I lost track of time and I brought it all the way to the school, all the way. He walked, he walked it all the way down the, down the street to the issue. I mean, in that story, you see two things. You see uh, his, his level of, 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 uh, of being beyond the world. But at the same time, you also see for Rabbi El Khan that his wife told, you know, he, he took out the garbage like every husband. He didn't say, I'm too great, I'm too... No, he, that's what he did in the house. That was his acts of service. He committed himself to the garbage and to the ketubah. Right? I will take care of you, my dear wife, whatever you feel you need. And it goes the other way too. You know, Wives take care of their husbands. It's also very important. Yeah. I'm not going to tell the women what to do. So that's why I'm telling you mostly about what the men have to do because if I tell you what the women want to do, yeah. But, um, you know, it's very important that, that uh, you know, in addition, the husband has to have many duties that he does. And obviously the wife also has many duties that she does. And for some men, the main thing is the acts of service. If the wife cooks for her husband a meal or something, right? For, you know, he, he obviously compliments her like we spoke about before. But, but for many men, that is their, their, uh, their love tank is filled with that. You now they say, the man, the way to a man's heart is through food. Now you could say it's the food, or you could say it's the preparation of the food. Right? It could be the food. But I think the way to a man's heart is through the acts of service that the wife has to do, everything she did, you know, to prepare the meal. And that is very important to, to the man. To feel that he's pampered, he's being taken care of. You know, men, if they would get married, you know, the mother takes care of them before and afterwards, you know. So when a, when a man gets sick, he needs to have chicken soup. Just the way it works, right? If he gets sick, he needs a chicken, because mother used to give him chicken soup. But, but now he needs it from his wife. And some wives say, you go get the chicken soup. I don't know. No. It's the acts of service. That's important to a husband. So we said it's almost like in the divine parallel. We do things for God and God does things for us. And that fills our tank. And that fills God's love tank to us. It goes both ways. But again, you need to know what is it. And that's why people need to speak to each other. Couples speak to each other. <laughs> 
and it's it's husbands and wives, it's parents and children, it's friends also to some degree, because that's the way you fill love tanks with acts of service, which are written out in the Ketuba. You need to interview each other and say, what is it that, that you want from me? And what is it that I can do for you? If you don't speak to each other, you don't know. And a lot of these times, it, there's a big uh, uh, influence. It's called childhood influences. The, uh, the kind of things that a spouse wants might be the things they saw their parents do in their home. It, it, people don't realize how childhood influences play such a significant role into knowing what are the acts of service. You know, we, we just got married. You know, my, my wife, uh, she uh, prepared Shabbos and everything, but at the end of Shabbos, uh, you know, Shabbos, you make a thing called the Cholent. Cholent is a very delicious delicacy, you know. And anybody know what Cholent is? I'm sure you all know what Cholent is. Cholent is like a, you know, Shabbos. You're not allowed to cook on Shabbos. But you're allowed to put up something on the pot from before Shabbos that continues to cook on Shabbos on its own. Providing it's already pre-cooked, it's already a cooked food before Shabbos, it's, it's basically cooked, then you can leave it just to keep on cooking on Shabbos. So there, were, there was a great argument between the rabbis and the Sadducees. The Sadducees said, the Torah says, you shall not light a fire on the Shabbos. So the Sadducees said, the Sadducees was a breakaway movement from from Judaism, they, they said, let's take the Torah literally. Torah says, you shall not burn a fire on Shabbos. So they said, no, we can't have, we can't have uh, food burning on Shabbos. You have to close your pots. You have to close your lights. You have to close everything on Shabbos. Shabbos, there's no fire. The sages held, no, the holy sages said, no. If you, if you prepared it from before Shabbos, already, you left it on. The Torah doesn't say you can't. Benefit from the fire that's already on from before Shabbos. But the Sadducees said, no, you can't. So the rabbis were adamant that they were right. And they said, that is the oral tradition. That's our, our tradition. We don't just follow the literal. We follow a tradition that we have from Moses at Sinai. And they were called the Pharisees. The Pharisees was the mainstream Judaism that we have today. Is the religion as we know it, the Judaism that is based on the Pharisees. And the Pharisees said, no, you, you can't. And to prove that they're correct and they're right, they made a tradition for the generations to show that you're allowed to benefit from a fire that was put on from before Shabbos and you're allowed to eat hot foods on Shabbos as long as it's being heated from before Shabbos. They invented the thing called the chalant. And that's why it's a mitzvah to eat chalant, the Shabbos, to show the correct definition of the Torah law. To show that the Pharisees are correct, that's where chalant comes from. Now, what is chalant? Chalant is, is a combination of all the kind of foods that you, you can, you can uh, cook for a longer period of time. Right? You can't put pasta in a chalant because it'll be dried out and that won't work. You can't cook it for 24 hours, 12 hours, 13 hours, as long as the chalant takes till the next afternoon. So what we do is we put in foods that sort of can last, can cook, can simmer on a flame, a low flame for a longer period of time and they become good the longer they're, they simmer. So things like potatoes, beans, all kinds of beans, kishka. You know, there's all kinds of things they put in there. Svart and put in put a hard boiled egg, you know. There's all, they call they call the Svart called tafina. Not trillant, but tafina. But trillant means a combination of all these different foods that we put. What, why, so as we said, it's in order to behave, able to have hot food on Shabbos, you're able to enjoy the Shabbos the next day, according to the understanding of the Pharisees, which became, which is today mainstream Judaism. So if you didn't start eating challenge yet, it's a good idea to start eating challenge on Shabbos. Yeah, lots of good recipes for challenge. It's very good. Anyways, okay, I guess that's one of my acts of service to give it to a challenge for me. So the... <laughs> Why am I telling you about the chalm? Because when we first got married, Goldie and I, um, you know, so after Shabbos, you know, the, 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 all the, the washing of dishes doesn't come to the cleaning of the chalm pot. Because you imagine something that's cooking for 24 hours in the same pot, it gets, you know, 
caught in the walls and you have to scrape it with, with, with steel wool and clean that pot. The pot is mamish, it's a disaster. It's a disaster, right? Today, they invented a new thing like a plastic bag that goes into the chalon pot, an insert that, 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 that today it's very clean. You just take out the bag and boom, everything. Goes. But in the olden days, when we get first got married, it was in a pot, a crock, you know, either you could do it in a crock pot or on, on a blech, on the, on, the, on the fire, whatever, either way, but the pot is, is, is it was a disaster. So uh, Goldie took the chalon pot after Shabbos and she put it in the corner and put a, 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 a towel over it left it in the corner. So I thought it was some kind of a ritual, ancient ritual that she has, you know, whatever, to leave it like covered with a, you know, she leaves it there a whole week. I'm saying, oh, comes the next Shabbos. She starts to say, what's going on? Why isn't the chalun pot washed out? So I said, oh, I don't know, like, no one told me. She says, in my house, my father, every Saturday night, he would wash, that was his job. He always washed the pot, the famous Cholon pot. My mother did many other things, but my father, that was his, uh, his gig. So I said, I'm sorry, I didn't know. So I found out the hard way, so to speak, about what my duties were. But because of my house, my father didn't wash the Cholon pot. He made the Cholon. In my house, that's what it was. I didn't either. <laughs> to be honest. But my, my house, my father used to take care of making the cholent, and and uh, my mother used to wash the pot. So, but in Goldie's house, her father did. So, to her, that was her act of service. She was waiting to, you know, for me to wash the pot. She left it in the corner because she thought that was a normal thing. The next week, the pot was moldy and smelly and everything. She, why? Because that was her her way of doing. That was the way that was that was her childhood influence. So a lot of these things, a lot of the acts of services, if you want to know what are the acts of service, we need to go back to, to uh, childhood influences. A lot of people, they marry each other because of uh, childhood influences. You know? Things that they saw in their home, that's the way they, uh, that, that molds a person. And uh, when we marry somebody, we, we need to find, we need to not, to, you know, when you marry someone under the chuppah, you're not marrying one person. You're marrying their parents. You're marrying their grandparents and their great grandparents. They all have an influence on this person that you marry. So you think you're just marrying the person. You say, take the goods and run. No, 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 no. Everything this person saw, this bride or groom under the chuppah, they're coming along with pekalach. They're coming along with packages. So we need, to, we need to discover what is the trajectory, what is the, the direction that, the, that that person that you married, you know, so you might not know about it right when you're married, but afterwards you need to interview each other. You know, what is it that you expect of me to do? Don't keep quiet about it. Say it. If that's the expectations, then we'll do it. But we need to know about it. We need to speak about it. You know, like I say, childhood influences are very important. Besides for Sigmund Freud that spoke about the mother and the, 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 all these things, which, which we all know that that's, that's an important thing. For people, but we also need to know that, that there are, you know, once there was a, a couple that came to the rabbi for, for counseling. And they were having problems in the marriage. And the, what was the problem? Problem was the wife says uh, to the rabbi, uh, my husband, I don't know what, on Shabbos, he's, he's like, he comes out home with, 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 with lots of guests. And, uh, you know, he, noisy guest brings him home. He doesn't even tell me that they're invited. He brings him into the house. And, uh, you know, like, where's the courtesy? Where's the menschlichkeit? So the rabbi asks her, and what, what was in your house when you were a child? So oh, my house. <laughs> my parents never had any guests ever. Oh, it's childhood influence, right? My parents, they, my, in our house, when, when, when people knocked at the door, my parents told everybody, lie down low, so they shouldn't know we're home. <laughs> they were worried maybe they might have to end up with some guests. Somebody knocked, nobody answered the door. Everybody, lie low. 
that was that was in her house. That's why she I, I was, oh, that's your childhood influence. But then the rabbi asked the question. He asked the girl, she, he says to her, by the way, can you tell me where did you meet each other? How did you meet each other? So she says, uh, we met each other? Yeah, I'll tell you the interesting story how we met each other. Um, my my husband, he was uh, he was uh, you know he, he had a flat tire, uh, actually. Um, no, we had a flat tire. We were driving with my parents. We were driving, and we had a flat tire on, on the street. And this charming young man comes out of the house, and he comes over and he says, "Wow, you guys have a flat tire. Let me fix your tire for you." And he got down under the car and he fixed the tire. And while we were there, he told my parents and me. He says, "Come into the house." And he said, "My parents said, well, you sure you want us? Yeah, come on in." And she, he brought us into his house and sat us down and introduced us to his parents and and we, we he gave us cookies and tea and everything and made us feel at home. And then he went out and he fixed the tire and everything and he said to, and I said, this is the kind of guy I want to marry. And eventually that one thing led to the other and I married the guy that fixed my tire. So the rabbi said to her, don't you see? It was precisely that outgoing family, outgoing nature that you were attracted to in the first place. And what, what attracted you to this guy? Because he was so friendly. He, was, he went out of his house. He fixed your tire. He invited you into this house. Uninvited. He brought you in. That was exactly what you liked about him because he wasn't like you. He wasn't like your family. So the rabbi said, why don't you meditate on that and remember that you, what you liked about your husband was not his quietness, not what you have in your house, but his, his, his hospitality, his ability to go out. So if you think about, so childhood influence, I'm just saying, is really the key to helping us in understanding each other, to understanding what is it that we need, and also understanding what is it perhaps that made us fall in love with each other in the first place. You got that, so it makes sense. So that's that's the story. So we're getting back to our our ketuba here. The ketuba is: I will spoil you, I will pamper you, I will give you, I will dress you, I will. It speaks over there. I will dress you, I will, I will, I will clothe you, I will feed you, I will. I'm going to do acts of service. Not to die in the service, like we said before, no, but but to do service for each other. And for some people, that's. That's the number one thing that they need in life is that they do things for each other. And to me, that basically sums up what the Ketubah is about. So today we discovered the second, first segment was the Kedushin, the ring ceremony. And today we, we discovered the middle part of the, of the, of the Chuppah ceremony, which is the Ketubah. And what the Ketubah, the essence of the Ketubah is about is that just like we have 613 mitzvot, what we have to do for God, acts of service and we called it service in the temple when we go to shul what do we call it we call it a service right so too we are stand in service of each other yeah i stand in service for you i i you know the, i i i stand in service for you yeah oh canada you know i will serve you i will take care of you we don't forget about each other that way. And that, for some people, like I said, is the, is the most important key to their heart is where they're doing things for each other. And that's what the Ketubah reminds us. Like I said, I said a lot of the secrets of, 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 of a good, happy life lie right there in the first seconds of marriage, standing under the chuppah. We're going through a ceremony, but that ceremony is really the key to the Jewish heart. Is in on these things. So, so far, we've, we've discovered how important words are, words of affirmation. We studied about gifts. And we also, this, today, we spoke about the acts of service that we need to do for each other in the context of marriage. So, I wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom and a happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah is around the corner, right? Believe it or not. Anybody have any questions? If you have any questions, please feel free. Anyone? Thank you, to you. Thank you, Rabbi. Enjoyed it as always. Thank you, Basil. Good Shabbos, everybody.
Good Shabbos. Shabbos, Basil. Good Shabbos, everyone. Good Shabbos. You're you. muted. Esther and, and Henry, nice to see you. Happy Hanukkah. Nice Shabbos. to be seen. Yeah, where are you? Nice to see you. Where Thank you. Okay. We uh, brought a friend down to Kensington uh, uh, for the eye clinic. She's having her eye surgery now. So we're just waiting on college here. Okay. Okay. Thank so you. Thank you. It was we're a waiting wonderful for a pickup sheer. and delivery. Yeah. Yeah. It was a wonderful sheer to listen to while we're waiting. Thank okay, you. Beautiful. Yeah. Glad I can make yeah. you easy. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Thanks. Um, bye. Bye. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Good job. The ultimate. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Yeah.